So I'm going to drag in in an empty folder and yes, create project for empty directory. And then go to colon hoish cd4 cd8, drag that in and hit import. Okay, um, so as many of you know, uh, a lot of pathologists or all pathologists, uh, our eyes are calibrated to H and E. So while we can kind of work in the shadows like this, um, wouldn't it be so nice if this were pink and blue, right? Or pink and purple. Okay, so this is this is the trick. And uh, I don't take credit for this. They showed me this. Okay, let's open up our channels. And are we in a time crunch or? Okay. Like a little bit. Take Okay. Do you think? okay, so hexed is, uh, you know, the lookup table is assigned to gray. So I'll turn hexed into uh, maybe like this blue. This, this, this keypad has more options. Than this. Okay. okay, and then um, I'm going to, um, you know, oftentimes the sort of green or 488 channel that has really nice autofluorescence, and it's a problem for for imaging and immunodetection, right? But actually it can be used to um, our advantage here, okay? So essentially the hexed is gonna be my hematoxylin-like stain. Um, the uh, green autofluorescence is going to be my um, eosin-like stain, which I'll assign to magenta, okay? And then there's this button right here, uh, invert background. And uh, you kind of have a, an H and E stain. <laughs> and actually, uh, if you want to, the the thing that I know it didn't come across necessarily in the slide yesterday, but uh, what Z was kind of showing here here it happens that uh, some cells are stained in um, in green, so that's why you know they're they're sort of dark pink. But uh, the other thing is like say for example, here are the CD4 T cells, right? And I think we can. Play with that a little bit. Clean it up. Oh, okay. Takes a little time. But I think I think you can see where this is going. If we take those CD4 T cells and assign them to a brownish color, and we remove our eosin. then in a sense, you're getting almost like a dab stain, right? And the, th this can be optimized, but so cool, right? Whoa. Okay. And uh, now that I've totally messed up the color table, uh, this is a, a section of colon, um, and it's a, it's somewhat of a tangential section, unlike the Swiss roll that you saw yesterday, where uh, hard to explain, but kind of a, you know, if, if you... <laughs> this is how a pathologist thinks, right? If you took my scalp, right, and you, you had a piece of my scalp here, and then you sectioned it this way, okay, then you would see all the hair standing straight up. But here, you're not seeing hair standing straight up. You're not seeing, you know, the, the microvilli and the crypts kind of line up. So, or sorry, the, the villi and the crypts line up. So uh, what this is, is it's, it's kind of a, it's a tangential section. So you're just getting like kind of some cross sections of crypts. So um, I'm always careful when I'm working with research tissues, because you never know what uh, mutant mouse you're working in. So I've gotten a lot of trouble before saying like, oh, this one has a lot of, this one has a lot of lymphocytes. And they tell me, oh, this, this animal has no lymphocytes. So, <laughs> but uh, long story short, um, so this lamina propria here, uh, the kind of uh, connective tissue in between the crypts, um, yes, there are immune cells there. And yes, they will be staining as, as Sarah will uh, show you. However, uh, bear in mind what kind of environment the colon is. Uh, it's not exactly, you know, sort of the cleanest place in your body. And there is, um, there's a lot of immune cells there um, sort of constitutively uh, to, to, you know, to do whatever they do to make sure that you don't develop, a, you know, bacterial translocation and whatnot. So um, that's that. And I will try to get you back your color, Sarah. Oh, one interesting thing here is look at all the, look at all the cells transmigrating the epithelium. And I should have showed this in, in H and E, but this was something that I had in my notes. Was this is an enterocyte, enterocyte, enterocyte? You can see the nuclei here. Um, maybe if I take away the green, you can see them a little better. You can see the nuclei. So there are enterocytes that 
kind of have a columnar morphology, right? They're tall and, and skinny. Um, look at all the cells migrating through the epithelium. This is not a normal amount of intraepithelial immune cells. And lymphocytes in particular, they have a, a special uh, property where they're able to, to, to transmigrate epithelia quite well. And that's it. All right. Um, I should ask who in the room is enough of an uh, enough of an immunologist to recognize what CD four, CD eight, CD one or three mean. Okay, good. Um, that just makes my life easier. Uh, also, there's a bunch of slides that we have going like in breaks that are making fun of immunologists. And, you know, <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> um, okay, so for the the rest of you. Uh, CD4s are one type of T cell, CD8s are another type of T cell, CD103, it's a kind of complicated marker, it doesn't necessarily mark like exactly one type of cell. I actually usually, usually associate it with uh, dendritic cells and myeloid cells, but it can be on, found on T cells too. The immune system does anything it wants at any moment. Um, can you actually go back to the first, the, the step one? Yes. Um, so we're going to uh, segment some cells, and since most of you um, remember how to do this, we can do it fast. Though I will say, uh, this this one's going to be harder than the ones we did yesterday. So, yeah, that's fair. This one. Yeah. So, analyze cell detection, cell detection. Um, Probably around there, something like that, and something like that. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, exactly. I will go back. Yeah. Yep. That's that's <laughs> analyze cell detection. Cell detection. Or you can I type in cell detection. Yeah. Right. Um, and I I started by drawing a small-ish rectangle. Uh, that's actually probably too big anyway. But you definitely want um, a rectangle that gets a couple of these scripts and a couple, sorry, a couple of the villi and a, a couple of the I, um, uh, surrounding region. What was your rationale for changing the um, nuclear stain to grayscale? Does that help you like? Uh, contrast, yes. Yeah. It doesn't affect the results at all, sure. make it whatever, um, but it shows up on the screen and on my screen much better in gray than in any other color. Sure. Your eyes see gray. I'm all the better at right. Yes. Um, okay, so here's the cell detection window. Um, these are the parameters that we were adjusting yesterday. Some of these I cheated and, and wrote, wrote out the answers, some of them I didn't. Um, uh, but I would lower sigma a little, lower the minimum size a little, and I like lowering the pixel size to match um, the image pixel size, uh, Pete actually recommends against, which always makes me uncomfortable to do anything he recommends against because he you knows those things, but I'm, I'm going to do it. And if you don't want me, don't do it. <laughs> um, and because these are um, the cells I'm most interested in are the lymphocytes and not the epithelial cells and parasites. And parasites. Yeah. yeah. The lymphocytes are small. The uh, intestinal cells themselves are large, but the markers are the intestine of uh, the lymphocytes. So I'm going to drop my cell expansion. Um, you don't have to use these exact settings. I really encourage you to try it yourself, play with the settings, um, see what happens. What prompted you to change the sigma and those parameters in this image? Yeah, um, the, so the sigma is the smoothing parameter. Um, Higher, higher sigmas will get you um, cells that tend to be a little clumped, and lower sigmas tend, will wake up cells into like over segmentation. Um, I just I usually start at one. That's just kind of my standard. Um, depends a little on your cells. Yes. Did you have any issue with this uh, nuclear theory overlap or from the other nuclear sigma? So okay, QPath um, won't let nuclei overlap. Um, and like the objects will themselves will not overlap. So um, it depends on what you want out of it. Do you want them? Would you rather the very touching cells just be counted as one object and then increase the sigma a little bit and smooth it all out? 
um, or if it's really important to you to know that it's two cells, decrease it more so that whatever little, whatever little like shape difference um, would like tell your brain that it's two cells. Do not hold my phone on. Um, right, I ran this. I don't see any cells. That's okay. Um, this uh, this little help menu has a has a warning telling me something's going on. And in this particular case, the thing that's going on that I need to know is that detections are hidden. And so we should press this button right here. Um, they're filled in right now. You could press F to unfill them. Um, those look different than your cells. You may have yeah. these cell settings yeah. different if you're the right click context menu. Um, for the moment, I'm actually only interested in the nuclei, so I'm going to just go uh, right click cells, nuclei only. Cell expansion are, is it mostly just for cells that are kind of just um, symmetrical? Yeah, the cell expansion doesn't work well for neurons or for macrophages. Okay. Um, it gets you. Usually, they have like a little bit of cytoplasm around the nucleus, and so it gets you a little bit, but it doesn't get better. But that not cell choice. Yes. Getting a lot of detections like in the middle of the of the grip, even though yes. I think I have the same setting for me. Uh, any idea? Like here? Uh like yeah, like the whole inside. Um let me go see my um okay. So I picked this example as day two on purpose because it is worse. Um the the cells themselves are denser, they're overlapping, like Right here, I by eye I count one, two, three, four cells. Um, but QPath is finding three. Yeah, it's merging these two. Um, and then uh, stuff like this, like these cells are just they don't have a lot of hoist, like they're just dim and kind of blurry. Um, so that's unfortunate. Oh, and, and you've got some merging here. Um, so this is one of those things where. Optimize the parameters as best you can. You will not get every cell. Uh, I'm going to drop the sigma some more. And how's my threshold doing? Threshold looks pretty reasonable. No, I'm going to raise the threshold because, like this, what it found here is not a real uh, cell. So I'm going to click on this, go to annotations, go to nucleus hoist mean, um, and this fake. Artifact cell has a mean of 840, so I want the threshold to be maybe a thousand. Yes. Now, yeah, is that that the reason? Spend a minute doing this. Raise your hand when uh, you feel pretty good about, you feel like you've gotten the best results you're going to get out of this method. What is the background radius mean? So it's like inverted? Uh... It, um, so for, um, it's a pre-processing step. And for every pixel, it takes a, in this case, eight micron radius around that pixel, takes the average intensity and subtracts it out. Um, what this is really good for is cases where you have, say, slow changes, like like autofluorescence changes, like the liver one we did yesterday, where the whole right half of the liver was just brighter. Um, it can like get rid of that background. Um, and if you have some super super dense cells where like everything is hunched, um, it can help um, like kind of find where the, the true edges are in cases like that. If so you a really crowded thing, if you want it higher, uh, yes. Um, uh, I usually leave it to the default. I know Mike actually usually takes it off entirely um, by default. Um, it, if you've got a clean image with nice looking cells, it doesn't make a huge difference either way. Yeah, so it's it's actually taking the minimum value. Um, so, oh, minimum, not the average. Okay. So you can think of it as like. As long as there is a background pixel within the distance of every pixel, um, and the place where that is the hardest is going to be right in the middle of the nucleus or cluster. So, sort of place it upon the size of the nucleus or the size of the, the cluster you've got. Yeah, you just need there to be a background pixel within that. Yeah, I thought it was average. Cool. Uh, 
Um, the one I haven't really talked about at all is this median filter radius. Um, the uh, this applies a well, uh, um, as a median filter uh, to your image before doing any of the rest of the steps, uh, probably after background detection, but um, next. Um, in bright field images, you almost never need it. Your image has so much signal that there just isn't like shot noise. Um, in really dim fluorescence images where like the, the background, um, the background variance is a, a meaningful issue in your life, um, then uh, applying this filter can just clean up everything. It's a shot noise filter. Okay, we're good. Okay. Um, once, okay, uh, move this uh, detection, move this window off to the side, or you can close it. You know how to get it back. And then delete this annotation. So I want to delete the object. I also want to delete the descendant objects. Nope, I delete. I wanted to delete them, not keep them. So because that was wrong, I'm going to go to objects, delete, delete all objects. Is it? Are the buttons flipped? Yeah. Says, do you want to keep yeah, I know. But like, are the, are the yes and no flipped? Oh, yeah. No, that's easy. Yeah. yeah, the yes and no are, are flipped. Uh, yeah. um, compa I, I, I do understand. <laughs> um, OK, so a lot of yesterday, we were just make, making that full image annotation, that square. Um, but most of your images aren't going to be square. So let's get a little fancy. We're going to go to, we're going to detect this entire tissue with all of its actual curves. Classify, pixel classification, treat threshold. Right. So this is going to threshold on the Hush channel. Um, I recommend a smoothing sigma of one. Um, uh, you want uh, everything that is above your threshold to be a class, and we're going to call it the region class. It is important that you put something in here. It doesn't really matter what, just you, you must name a class. Um, and then let's find a threshold that generally finds this tissue. Maybe a thousand? Um, so what you probably found is that responded very, very quickly, but the result is very pixelated and blocky. Um, this is due to the resolution we're using. Um, where it starts on the lowest possible resolution, or this one did. I don't, I don't remember if that's the default. You do, yeah. Um, so that you get fast results. Um, and sometimes for finding whole pieces of tissue, blocky is fine. You don't really care. But if you want a little bit more accurate, um, you can drop your resolution from extremely low to very low, and you you get more curves. Um, and the choice here is absolutely just a balance between how accurate do you want your results versus how much time do you want to spend processing. Um, these are pretty small images, so even if you go like high, it'll it's not so bad. Um, the other thing that you can immediately see as as you get more resolution, um, sometimes the results can actually be worse. I I want to count the the crypt inside as part of my tissue. With, it really is. I don't want to remove all of that. So I'm going to go back to very low info button. Um, and I still think my threshold's a little too high because like it's not it's not getting to the edge. So let's drop that down. And then just the updates and triggers when she clicks on something else out of that. Yeah. Give us a name and hit save. So I now have saved this classifier. And I'm going to create objects. Um, I want to create objects for the entire image. Um, it is, I definitely want an annotation, not a detection, because we're going to be working inside of it later. Um, let's go with a minimum object size of a million. 
That way, things like this little blip here just get deleted because it's too small. I don't, I don't care about that blip for these. Um, the minimum hole size, um, actually, I'm going to cancel cancel this just to show Ken the image. Ken, would you count this as part of the tissue area? Well, are you counting the, the lumens of the kind of, uh, yeah, transverse? I am going to count those, yes. Then count those, because that's, that's just the lumen that's in pinned in. Minimum object size is a million. What's the, quick question. Yes. What's up on the back of the screen? Oh, good. Uh, yes, so sir. Lumens, uh, are you counting these lumens? Well, I'm, I'm just, I, I was suggesting to keep the, to keep it standard. And mm -hmm. since the other lumens are being counted, I suggest counting this one too. What do you, what do you think? Well, so this, this can be a best seller or wrong field and anything like, there could be a good results in both sides. I, I like, like the idea of keeping the system because Thank you. It depends on what you're trying to quantify. So if you're still trying to quantify tissue area, some people might say that the lumen of structures, whether it be the lumen of uh, intestinal cells or the lumen of blood vessels, is not relevant. But in certain disease conditions, you might have a hemorrhage that spills over into a lumen, and you might want to quantify erythrocytes that autofluoresce in the C channel. So it all depends on the biological question you want to answer. Um, Um, just so, just as an example, um, nope, I so don't I use a million. Use a hundred thousand. I don't know why. Because I made uh, I added too many zeros. Uh, um, make the minimum make the minimum size a hundred thousand, not a million. Um, the, in this case, I did both, but I'm also going to delete this. Um, just to show you what the other op the other option looks like. Um, if I make a minimum object size of 100,000 and a minimum hole size of 100, it you find the cheats. Not really. That's okay. Um, so it actually like works around all of these little holes. Does that mean that if you are uh, uh, if you're keeping the whole side as hundred, not taking the lumen. Um, it was going around. It was going around the lumens. Um, what it so the reason you want it hundred instead of like zero is it'll find one weird gap that for whatever reason doesn't have a cell and just like start having tiny tiny little holes that are just annoying and you don't want to deal with them at all. Um, and for large images that can really slip through that. Now. Yes, you want to give give that a simple order annotation when you also. But for, depending on the argument, is that right? How do you get that out now? Yes, yeah. create objects. Uh, hold on. Let me undo this. Uh, create objects, uh, choose parent or image. Okay. Um, and then um, put in your minimum sizes. Um, if you made, uh, when you were making the classifier, um, if you used the region class, which I would suggest is what I used, make sure you have this button checked, the create object or ignored classes. Yes. I made exactly the same mistake one time, so maybe we need to change over. I would fill annotations that was actually the view, sort of fill those in. Yeah. If not, but it's fillable. Sorry, no, I was trying to, I, I was trying to show like uh, show the outline so that you can see more. Which, yes. Yes. Um, Mike made a comment earlier mm -hmm. what you said earlier. Oh, oh, I think it was just that uh, QPath will run more smoothly. The simple, simpler the annotation is. So if you have a whole slide image and you're making tons of little holes, that will, on your laptop at least, probably dramatically slow things down or, or cause QPath to crash. So removing all those holes when they aren't biologically important to your question, you make run the QBAT run a bit smoother. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I could agree. Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, so what Mike was saying is that the um, QPAT runs faster if your annotations are relatively simple. Um, if you have a huge annotation and you um, subtracted every tiny little lumen and there's all these little intricate details, it slows down all of the further processing. 
So is, is, that, yes. is there a trouble because the whole blue or the whole blue is in the outline? Uh, no, it, it, the, the, it's going to be the same color. Um, what you might have on is uh, this. This is the um, thresholder classifier. It, uh, it's, it's showing you exactly which pixels are classified. And the difference between what's blue right now and what's blue right here and like the outline is going to be the subject of Pete's presentation later. At least a little bit. Yes. Yes. So if we do want to remove the lumens. Yes. So what do we do? You would um, make the minimum hole size smaller. I'd still recommend going bigger than zero, but like make it smaller than um, whatever is the smallest lumen you wanted. So if like a lumen needs to be 500 microns squared to count, otherwise it's just a weird gap, put this at like 400. We're good, we have cells? Uh, we, no, we have tissues? Okay, then I now have this twice for some reason. Okay, then select your tissue annotation, bring back up the cell detection window. Um, if you had accidentally closed it, that's okay. Go to the workflow, find the last place you did cell detection, and double click, and run. Okay. From here, I'm going to, um, I had show grayscale on to make the hoist gray. I'm going to turn that off and turn on the CD103 channel. Okay, how many people have full tissue cells? Um, so we have to find the CD103 um, and we're going to do that with a pretty simple classifier called a threshold classifier. Um, Mike showed this at the very beginning yesterday. Classify, object classification, um, create single measurement classifier. So now instead of looking at the pixels directly, we're only going to be measuring the cells that have already been segmented. Um, so it's important that you've done the cell detection, otherwise nothing's going to happen in the screen at all. So I'm going to, there was a little confusion, so I'm just going to go back, classify, object classification, uh, create single measurement classifier. Um, at this stage, if you can't see your detections, make sure your detections are visible. Um, and I recommend filling them in. Okay. So each of these cells has a large number of measurements, um, a bunch for every channel, as well as shape um, and things like nucleus to cells area. We can classify based on any one of them. Um, so here, here's that same list of everything that you can classify on. Um, one way to make that, that list look a little simpler is to use this channel filter. And we want to classify based on the CD103 channel. And so this immediately simplifies to only the measurements that say CD103 in their names somewhere. Yes. So in terms of uh, which measurement you look at, is this the list better? Yes. Uh, so I'm going to turn on both. I'm going to unfill them for the moment. And then I'm going to go find some CD103 cells. My segmentation is not great. Um, OK. So once again, the inner circle here is the nuclear measurements. The outer circle here is the cytoplasm measurements. And then the whole, the whole thing is the cell. Um, here, I picked the that perfect classic example where you see the membrane, CD103 is a membrane marker, so you see the membrane staining and it's great. Um, but there's a lot of cases that don't look quite that clean. 
uh, oh, two times. Like for instance, this cell, um, very likely what happened is the cell is round and the um, FFP section got was like here, so that it gets this membrane as well as the whole top membrane. Um, therefore, it looks as if this, the uh, marker is nuclear. It, it's not, but the, the marker is inside the nucleus uh, object. So um, I, I usually don't use cytoplasm. Um, it's just too variable. I either go with nucleus for markers like KI67 that are truly biologically nuclear or full cell um, for everything else. Um, so I would go cell uh, C103 mean. Um, you also don't want to use max because that'll look at for whatever is the single brightest pixel. So if you, if you have a bit of noise, it'll turn positive. Or if your cell segmentation is just a tiny bit inaccurate and you grabbed like a tiny bit of a neighboring CD103 positive cell, the, um, that would uh, that, that would make your max CD103 look high. So mean is usually the right one. Where did you find the single measurement classifier? Classify, object classification, single measurement classifier. OK. Um, then we need to give uh, the cells a class. Um, so in the annotations tab, um, go to the class list, right click, add, add class. We're going to do that again. Right click, add, add class. And I'm going to call them CD103. If you're an immunologist and you immediately want to call these something different, name it whatever you want, whatever is meaningful to you. And then I'm going to set my above threshold to CD103. That lab updates. Hit like preview. Make sure your detection is on. And now the the red cells are negative, and the blue labeled cells are what it currently considers positive. Um, QPath attempts to do a auto threshold based on I don't know what math, um, something. Okay, but I, I usually do want to change it in one direction or another. Um, so what I'm going to do is go through. Um, turning the detections on and off with the button D and seeing if it's, seeing if I'm having more false positives or more false negatives. Here, I seem to have a bunch of false positives like these two cells here. So I'm going to raise the threshold, which you can do like that. Oh, immediate fe feature request. Sorry, we have to do this in the middle of the presentation. In the um, brightness contrast histogram, so you decided a log button. Can you can you make this log? Yes. Maybe. Okay. Hmm? Yeah, you can also you can. Yeah. Okay. So go through your tissue. Um and it, yeah yes. Sorry, how did you get a CD one hundred and three to appear on the above threshold? Um. Yep, you, you make it, you first make the class, right click, add remove, add class. Okay. Um, so super important that you don't just look at one area because things happen and little bits of your tissue will be brighter or dimmer than the rest. Um, so you want to um, look at all the corners of your tissue. If you have, um, that, it, I, ideally, you want to actually look at multiple samples. So like pick a threshold that looks good on this sample, then go check your knockout or go check your isotype or whatever controls you have, whatever groups you have, and just make sure you're satisfied with your threshold across the board. Yes? Um, yesterday, when we were setting multiple thresholds, we looked for a specific cell that barely fit yep. our identity. Yep. Um, should, can we do the same thing here, where we look for what we barely consider? Yes. You absolutely can. So like this cell, um, this is one of those cases where it's picking up a little bit of the neighboring cell. So I don't want to count this. So I'm going to click on it, go to the annotations tab, go find the cell CD103 mean. And it this has a mean of a thousand. So that's our threshold. 
should be past the thousand. Should, should be past the thousand. Okay. Uh, that being said, this one I think should be counted and isn't. Sarah, is there a hot key in here because it sounds like it's being loud and loud? See. You can actually see the last uh, hot key okay. fuse okay. right here yeah. where it says last shortcut. Okay. So, for example, she pressed E, that toggles the textions. Um, and then whenever she presses a number, that changes the channel from channel one to channel one. Um, this is a great example of there is no one threshold that's going to make every cell happy. Later in the afternoon, we'll get into, at some point later, we'll get into uh, machine learning classifiers that do a better job. Still not perfect, but better. Yes? Is it possible to do cells that actually online like the multiple channels? So um for the part where you're detecting the cells or the part where you're classifying them? Uh, not with the standard built-in um QPath detection. Uh cell pose, which we'll talk about a little bit tomorrow, uh can do two channels. Yes. No, it's membrane. Uh, it's membrane. Membrane? Yeah. Okay, that's why we are uh, giving cell as the measurement. Not the yeah. Yes. I don't know what uh, many markers are seen in general. It's not like the membrane, membrane, but it's just the measure of the whole cell. Mm -hmm. That's a different issue, obviously. Once you've picked your threshold that you are that's right enough. Good question. Yesterday, yeah. the DAD, we did, we had like low, middle, and high. Is yes. that a different classification than what we're doing now? Yeah, or? that was the um, positive cell detection. Um, DAB historically does have this low, middle, high thing, and you calculate H score. Um, pathologists use it clinically. Um, so they, the workflow that's like made for DAB has that. Um, that's not really common in fluorescence. Typically, you just do positive or not um you, if if you're if you're real happy with your saving you can start doing like low or or, or bright um so by the way this workflow applies for DAB. yeah sorry i'm just saying a lot of diagnostic standards of care um you might want to do an h score and an h score is defined as 100 times the lowest threshold number of cells 200 times the uh, second lowest threshold 300 times the highest threshold and we get an H score out of, I believe, a total of 300, of course, divided by 300. But for simplicity's sake, percent positive scoring, the general yeah. that's most workflows, unless you transfer up to taking out some clinical paper. Okay. So that was positive cell detection and then yeah. the general classification. Uh, yeah, uh, single measurement classifier. Um, so after you've done your CD103 classifier, uh, go back to the annotation staff, click on your annotation, and you can read out uh, how many total detection, how many total cells are, which is 12,000, how many CD103s, which is 1,000, so we're at about 8% positive. Um, or if you prefer, you can calculate it as 1,000 divided by uh, about a million microns squared and get your positive frequency. Everyone good? Yes. Is there a way to do adaptive thresholding? Yes. Um, there's a it's it, there's a machine learning classifier. Um, so there isn't a like actually yes, there is. So yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. So if my cell detections total are like only eight thousand yeah. compared to your twelve thousand. Yes. What do you think? If like what parameter did I um, it could either be the smoothing sigma um, or the uh, threshold intensity threshold. Okay. In in the cell detection. Yes. Okay. okay. Yeah. The the classifier will not change the cell detection. Like once it exists, the cells exist. Yes. After doing this, can I go back and change the cell detection? You can. Or start again. You actually can. You it's similar to starting again. Like you could delete these cells, make them again. You still have your classifier. 
that exists. Um, so you don't have to like reset the questions. Um, yeah. Um, okay. Uh, for those of you who are a little bit more comfortable with um, computers and scripting and all that, um, now that you've saved the classifier, if you go to Open Directory Project, um, there's there's this classifiers folder. There's classifiers, object classifiers. Um, there's also fixed classifiers, but you need one of those. You can double click on this JSON file. Um, and yeah. Um, is that really it? Yeah. Uh, this is the file that defines the classifier. Um, and at this stage, all it says is that you set a threshold and what your um, positive class is. Um, but like that's how it's stored. You can read that in other languages if you don't want. Anything? Okay, that will be later. Um, okay, we all basically there. All right, running a half early on uh, yeah, first talk. Um, I know how that feels. <laughs> oh God, is basically going to go to Okay, once. Uh, Mark's next, and I'm gonna let him talk. So I'm gonna yes, you are. But oh, okay. sure thing. Um, it's a positive score. So, I'll see if you can move to my mouth. Okay. 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 Anyone have any questions? Okay. Or did you make a CPU in some order? Yes. Um, so I made my classifier and I think I might change the one of three class, mm -hmm. but I can see the detection, but I can't see the CD one of three detection. Is that something I need to like visualize or put them like through? Um, you might have hidden them. Um, so I have to go like, on the annotation. Oh, that that is a good thing to show. Um, this 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 view can be a little overwhelming. There's just a lot of red lines. So what you can do is go to annotations, click on none, and hit space. <laughs> this hides all of the cells that are class that are unclassified or classified as the none class. Um, so that now all you see are the positives. Um, and I just like to do this to like make it less intense. And it makes it obvious where you need to miss something too. Yes, like, it does. Like right here. Look. Yeah. That should be itself. And then how do you turn it back? back. Space again. Space again. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and of course, it, it also works the other way. You can hide your positive selves. Yes. Yeah, I have like a Z stack. Does this still work on Z stack? Or do you need to take a single yeah, I think if you just do the like, like through here, it just picks the middle, but there's scripting ways of doing it. Yeah, all of them take your annotation and make yeah. a copy of it on all slices of your deep stack and then run cell detection on all slices. The trick is like what that means, right? Because you're going to have different measurements on each of these slice, and those cells are different objects. So if you take your sum of all of your objects, you're probably going to have one object counted multiple times and it's shown up on multiple deep slices. On the other hand, if you don't have that object on multiple deep slices, it's just like a well separated C stack, then you can go through and find something more. It's but you can't tie them all together. Is it possible to pair annotations between the set positions? Like, say that there's overlap between. Uh, a detection on yes. zero compared to one or something like that. You, yeah. you absolutely could. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the accuracy, of course, will depend on your script, but like yeah. many things are possible for scripting. Um, yeah, I tried doing it before and I struggled with it, but I didn't even know if there was actually a way to. Uh, it, it, it was built in. What I would yeah. generally do is create like some kind of object type thing, uh, that new field, and just like say anything inside of so it. And then I assign all that same mm -hmm. measurements. Mm -hmm. But then you'd have to wrangle it all in the Excel documents outside. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes. So, how does this cell detection change with other like non circular like uh, macro pages or whatever? Uh, cells which are like more complicated. Yeah. Um, if you've got endothelial cells, uh, depending on your settings, it, it I have seen it like break them into 
um, basically two circles instead of one elongated one. Um, macrophages usually gets the nucleus okay. It's not going to get the projections at all. Um, uh, neutrophils are rough because if you've got a high resolution image of a neutrophil, it's it's um, it's not punctate, multi lobed, and it really wants those to be uh, three either three set foot cells. Um, 